Okay, this is Dr. Jenkins. We are back for part two of the water and fluid balance chapter. I'm actually gonna, I feel like it's so bright, it's uh, hurting my eyes. Okay, that's better. <laughs> All right, so in the first part of this chapter, we talked about how much water our body has, what the functions of water are. We talked about where we store water. We talked about electrolytes. Um, we talked about the regulation of fluid balance. And then we talked about ways in which we bring in fluid and ways in which we get rid of fluid. So we're going <clears> to <throat> pick up where we left off. The goal is to be in fluid balance, which, as I said before, is to bring in as much water as, ne as, as needed to replace what you've lost. And despite <clears throat> small shifts in this over the, over the course of days, when we have a consistent imbalance, it can lead to problems, which you already know about. Um, simply put, if we don't bring in as much water, hold on. Let me say that again. Apparently, I'm just not with it today. I'm going to come back, though. Here's the comeback. <laughs> if we lose more fluid than we bring in, we're dehydrated. And if we bring in more fluid than we lose, we're overhydrated. This is like the simplest PowerPoint slide, perhaps in collegiate teaching, teaching history. Let's talk a little bit more specifically about it. Um, dehydration is probably more common, but we are going to talk about overhydration because it can happen. You know about dehydration. Um, at first, you'll see increased sweating, redness, fatigue. You may even see some dizziness. Make sure you review some of those symptoms that I underlined. When we talk about dehydration, it can lead to heat illness. And probably we've all experienced heat cramps. Maybe you've experienced the next worse phase, which is heat exhaustion. And the worse would be heat stroke. This is the most serious type of heat illness, which is almost always accompanied by dehydration. In someone with heat stroke, they actually will no longer be sweating. And they'll have cool, clammy, pale skin. So the initial phases of dehydration and heat illness, you'll see increased sweating, redness, and fatigue. Um, but as it gets worse and worse, you very well may see a loss of sweating. So if you ever have a loss of sweating, uh, you know that you're in a lot of trouble. So stop what you're doing, go into shade, go into a cool place. Um, the treatment is just what I said. I'm not going to worry about this. You can read about the prevention. Um, I'm going to summarize the prevention. Are you ready? Think ahead. So that means hydrate before you go do something and plan ahead so you have proper hydration with you. And then also, in addition to thinking ahead, pay attention to the environment and yourself. Because the environment can change. It may start off not being very hot and humid, um, but it may change. And also, pay attention to yourself. Notice if you stop sweating. Notice if you're feeling not like yourself. Again, like I said in the first video, we're going to be covering a lot of material. You only need to know what it is I'm writing down or circling or underlining. The rest is all extra, will not be on the test. And I mean that. Okay. Um, here we see some situations when it's happened in real life. Um, for the life of me, I cannot think of this football player's name. Any other moment that I'm talking about this, uh, Corey something, uh, ex-NFL player, died during preseason. This is Julie Moss. I want to say it was the 1983 D, uh, Ironman. She come, her body completely shut down. 
Um, so it can really have bad effects. I don't like to talk about myself too much, um, but I do have a case study of myself. So this is me in the second marathon I ever did many, 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 many years ago. Um, and it was in Burlington, Vermont over Memorial Day, which is late May. So here I was, I had trained all summer, or excuse me, I trained all winter, right? So I trained all winter and spring when it was cool. And then I show up in Burlington, Vermont in the end of May and it was 85 degrees. So there was really nothing I could have done. Um, I was not acclimatized to the heat. So even though I drank and drank and drank, I still ended up being dehydrated. So much so that um, at about mile 24 of the marathon, uh, I stopped sweating. I was becoming dizzy. I wasn't able to run in a straight line anymore, so I kind of kept bobbing to the sides. I did cross the finish line, but then I passed out. So they took me to the medical tent, and I actually, right here, you can see my actual medical tent report. So you can see what they circled. Fatigue, lightheaded they circled, weakness. And then uh, I like how they circled altered mental status. <laughs> um, which you can see right after the race. This is one o'clock in the afternoon. My blood pressure was low because I was dehydrated. After you run a marathon, your blood pressure should be high. Normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. I was low because I just didn't have as much fluid in my body. My pulse was really high. Those two go hand in hand. My body temperature was a little bit higher than it should have been, 101.6. Uh, and what's also cool is they uh, took a little pinprick on the end of my finger and they took potassium and sodium numbers. All right, so we can see that my sodium was 138. Let me go back. 138. I know the number, but I want you to see it because I feel like you'll remember it more if you see it too. 138 was my sodium. So I was at 138. So I was slightly hyponatremic or low on sodium. My potassium was seven, which is really high. So I was low on sodium, hyponatremic, and I was high on potassium, hyperkalemic. And that's precisely why I was feeling altered mental status because I didn't have the proper electrolyte balance and remember, electrolytes are charged particles that carry a current. So if you don't have the right electrolytes, you cannot generate a nerve impulse. Okay. They gave me Gatorade. Uh, they gave me Zofran, which is an anti-nausea med, because even the water they were giving me, I was throwing it back up. It was terrible. So stay hydrated. Okay. By the way, this is not gonna be on the test, it's just an information. Okay, so what are the effects of dehydration on performance? You can see some statistics. It's interesting, but I'm not gonna ask you that specifically. What I want to point out is, you can have a decrease in performance when you have a minimum of 2% loss of body weight. So 150 pound person, that's three pounds. And that's actually quite doable, particularly if you're exercising for a long duration. We can also think about this influencing people when they're working outside um, in the heat over a long period of time. Okay, the rest here is just extra information, um, but I did want you to know that impairment in performance can begin uh, at a minimum of 2% of body weight. As you lose more body weight due to dehydration, uh, your performance goes down. So like, I, I think I was talking about this in the protein chapter. We think we know something, um, but it's good to see the research to back it up. Okay, before we go on, I'm a little bit all over the place today. I remembered Corey Stringer. Uh, this may have actually been when you guys were very, very young. I'm going to say it was 2001. Corey Stringer died in preseason, overheated. 
As a matter of fact, UConn, they have a specific lab that's focused on research on hydration, and it's named the Corey Stringer Institute because of that. Okay, so why? Why does your sport performance go down when you're dehydrated? Well, you don't have as much blood volume. So remember, when you're sweating a lot and you're dehydrated, you're losing a lot of water through sweat. And you're not able to bring in as much to make up the difference. So we have an imbalance. And remember, blood is mostly water. So if I have lost a lot of water through sweat and I haven't been able to replenish it all, I'm absolutely going to have a lower blood volume. This means can't send as much blood to the muscles. I mean, blood pressure also goes down, so we have less fluid that's pumping around our bloodstream at less pressure. So one simple reason why our support performance goes down when we're dehydrated is because there's less fluid volume, less blood volume, which means that there's less blood to pump out to the muscles. And remember, that blood is bringing in oxygen. That blood is bringing in glucose. All of the rest of these things are true, but uh, the only thing I will ask you for on an exam is what I've written on the screen. Okay. Now, overhydration is also possible. And believe it or not, even though it's less common, it still happens. It's most common to happen in an endurance event. Okay, because here's what happens. You have a marathon runner and it's been drilled into their head. Hydrate, hydrate, stay hydrated, replenish electrolytes and water. And they do. And there's a much larger amount of water they're bringing in so they just simply overhydrate. And this can be really bad because what it can do is it can cause your cells to take in water. Let me change the color. When there's so much water, too much water goes into the cells and the cells can burst. Seriously. You think I'm not serious? I'll tell you how serious I am. This link might not be available anymore, but I'm sure if you put it into Google, there was a case at SUNY Plattsburgh, God, it's probably been 15 years ago by now, where there was a uh, the, the men's lacrosse team. They were doing their little drinking event where they were hazing the freshmen, right? But there was one gentleman that said, I do not drink alcohol. So they said, okay, we'll just have you drink water. So during this hazing event, this gentleman was just funneling water, water, water. He took in so much water, he died. Why? Because his cells burst. So even though it's much less likely to happen, it can happen. Okay. This picture up top here is actually um, just something I threw in here. And I'm sorry to be a little bit graphic, but you know, we're all friends by this point in the semester. So, you know, some people lose, well, all of us, not, not only do we lose fluid when we sweat because water comes to the surface of our skin, we also lose salt. And this is variable. Some people lose more salt than others. I will confess to you that I'm a pretty salty sweater. And I have had many a workout hat that has <laughs> developed a white crust on it because that's evidence of all the salt that I'm losing. Which is to say, as I said before, when talking about fluid balance, pay attention to yourself. So when I see that, I know that I'm a salty sweater. So I need to make sure that I'm replenishing enough of my sodium. Here is some more, here's some more information about overhydration. You do not need to know these, okay? All right. Okay, 
So let's get to the meat and potatoes. Here I've gone on and on talking about how important water is and electrolytes. But how do we talk to athletes about how much fluid they should be drinking? And I will tell you, this can sometimes be a hard proposition. Why is this difficult? Well, it's difficult because, as I said, it's very difficult to measure sweat loss because it evaporates into the air. So how do you measure that? Some of the sweat that goes on your skin that doesn't evaporate soaks into your clothes. Um, I will share with you, um, as, many, as, as you may know, I got my PhD in exercise physiology. So we attempted to measure sweat rate in a lot of our experiments. And as dutiful grad students, a lot of times we as ourselves were the subjects. So I was a subject once, and our best attempt at measuring sweat rate was before I even exercised in that little lab, I had my weight taken completely nude, and then my clothes that I was going to wear were in a pile, and we weighed my clothes. So we had a pre-exercise weight of my clothes and a pre-exercise nude weight of me. Uh, we did the exercise session with a good old-fashioned tarp on the bottom. We measured the tarp before the exercise session. I did the exercise after it was done right away, took all my clothes off, and we reweighed my clothes, and we reweighed me nude, and then we reweighed the tarp with all of my sweat on it. And from that, we were able to do calculations to see how much weight I lost nude how much fluid I lost that way, but then how much of that fluid that I lost went into my clothes, because my clothes were definitely heavier because they were sweaty, and then how much weight, uh, how much fluid was added to the weight of the tarp. And of course, that is still not going to be completely accurate because I was breathing out some fluid loss through my breath. Okay, so it's hard, but let's try and do our best to talk about it. All right, daily fluid requirements. <sighs> There's so many ways to try and give these recommendations. And it's really dependent on who you are, your age, your gender, your weight. As a general rule, and I've mentioned this to you before, it's good to have ballparks. So here are our ballparks for the men. A nice ballpark figure, again, it's not exact, but a nice ballpark figure for how much fluid you should be ingesting. And this is, of course, at rest, not including exercise. So when we exercise, we know we're going to need to bring in more than this. Three liters per day is a good ballpark for men. Two liters of water per day is a good ballpark for women. Okay, know those numbers. Um, I wanted to give you some reference for this. So three liters for men, two liters for women. A two liter bottle looks like that. Men would need to have one and a half of those two liter bottles. I also broke it down this way. So we have these 17 ounce water bottles, which is a usual size for a water bottle. Um, an athlete who expends about 2,000 calories would need to have about four to six bottles, 2,800 calories, six to eight bottles. These are ballparks. I'm just trying to give you some references. Okay. But what about, what about exercise? So we know at rest, men need about three liters of water. At rest, women need about two liters of water. With exercise, the needs are higher. How much higher really depends. Depends on the intensity of your exercise, the duration of your exercise. It depends on what environment you're exercising in. It depends on whether you're trained or not. Here are some ranges. You do not need to know these ranges because I think it's not really that worthwhile. Other than to know that, of course, athletes, and especially during exercise, need more. Okay, some other things to point out. Staying hydrated all throughout the day, even on your rest days, 
really sets you up well for success. So those people that are hydrated pre-exercise, they are the best prepared. So it's not like you shouldn't care about how much you drink, how much water you drink every rest day. No, of course you should. So the better off you're hydrated 24-7, including rest days, the better off you're going to be when you start doing exercise. We know the reasons why it's important. I don't need to go over that again. Okay. They've actually done studies that have looked at pre-exercise hydration. The fancy word for that is hyperhydration because hyper as a prefix means more than. Um, to a certain extent, drinking a little bit more than usual going into your exercise session is a good thing. So I would say athletes should slightly to moderately increase fluid intake before activity. This is like the day before or the morning of. But when we have athletes significantly increase their fluid intake before, it actually acts as a detriment because then for that period of time, the athlete is overhydrated and that can actually be detrimental to performance. And that's why you see down here, the study results are a bit unclear because hydration is such a hard thing, all right? But I think it's safe to say athletes should bring in some more water right before, the day before. These are some suggestions. You do not have to know any of these suggested amounts. If I have you memorize all these milliliters or ounces, I just think it's gonna drive you up the wall and have you memorize numbers but not really understand the concepts. So if you wanted to look into how much you should be pre-hydrating, well, here it is but you don't need to memorize it for the test. What I do want to say is that for the most part, actually for almost the all part, <laughs> pre-exercise hydration, water is best. This is not the time to bring in the Gatorade. Before, before you're exercising, you're not likely to be electrolyte deficient. You're not likely to be glucose deficient. So the, the only benefit of Drinking Gatorade before is that it tastes good because it has added sugar that you don't need at that time. So water is best. Okay. Um, some other guidelines. You know, everyone is different. And this is a theme that we're going to talk about again and again. People have very variable sweat rates. I mean, countless studies have done this. Try and assess sweat rate as best you can um, across a larger sample of people. There's really not a whole lot of things that we can draw conclusions from. Um, so people are really variable, really varied. So you just have to trial and error to learn yourself, okay? Learn about what hydration is going to work for you, whether or not you're a salty sweater to get an idea of how much how many electrolytes you need to replenish. Um, and of course, avoiding alcoholic beverages before, probably a good thing. Okay, let's switch to talking about during exercise. So what do we know? Well, we know that dehydration will impair performance. It's most likely to impair endurance performance because our body is actually quite good at shifting water around. So in a shorter duration sport, even if you're dehydrated, it's less likely to impact you. It will at certain amounts of dehydration, but endurance people are more likely to suffer the effects of dehydration. Um, I've said this before, but sweat rates vary. So you just have to do trial and error. Um, one of the best ways to do this with yourself is to weigh yourself before and after activity. Especially on a hot day, get a sense of how much weight you lose. 
If you lose a lot of weight, this means that you probably sweat a lot. Okay, and if you lose a lot of weight, you sweat a lot, you're gonna need to focus more on bringing in more fluid. Thirst is not a good indicator. Your hypothalamus does its work well before you get thirsty. So you are getting into dehydration even before you become thirsty. You become thirsty because your hypothalamus is trying to beat you over the head. It's tried other things to try and counteract your dehydration. But when you're thirsty, it's finally telling you, God darn it, drink. So don't use, I mean, it, obviously it means that you're dehydrated, but that alone is not a good indicator. You should be drinking little bits often to avoid being very thirsty. Okay, here's uh, right from your book showing that endurance time goes up. Or excuse me, that endurance... Hold on. Yeah, your endurance time goes up. You're able to exercise for longer when you hydrate. That's pretty simple. Okay, what about the addition of glucose? We already know this. Needed in activities that are continuous and lasting about 60 minutes or more. The thing about these sports drinks is that not only do they contain glucose or some type of sh simple sugar, they also contain our electrolytes, potassium and so sodium. When you're exercising for over an hour, you need to replace sugar and you need to replace electrolytes. If you're exercising for less than an hour, you do not need to replenish electrolytes. You have enough. So the same rule that applied for sugar applies to electrolytes. These are the reasons why. Oh, let me, let me take that back. <laughs> These are suggestions for how much fluid you should be ingesting based off of the intensity and based off of the environment in which you're exercising. I am not gonna ask you these specific numbers, but if you're looking for an idea, this can give you an idea. When we do studies, we can get guidelines. Um, as we exercise for longer at a higher intensity, our sweat loss goes up, so we need to bring in more fluid. I'm not going to ask you any of these numbers either, but it's here if you'd like to look at it. This is making the point that I've already made. Sweat rate varies between individuals. Okay, so a lot of it is just getting to know yourself. All right, so what can we deduce from all this discussion? The goal of your fluid intake is to match bringing in your fluid with what you lose. I am going to have you know this amount during so we're talking about during right during exercise just to give you a ballpark everyone's different but just to give you an idea you should be bringing in about seven to ten ounces of fluid every 10 to 20 minutes that's a nice general guideline some people need more some people need less what is this telling us it's telling us bring in small amounts often so when possible bring in smaller amounts often when you have a time out a couple of sips here a couple of sips there boom when i'm on the bike i actually every 10 minutes try and take a sip of water okay all right i've given you some examples here i am not going to ask you this but it just gives you some practical applications of the ballpark of where you should be. And again, everyone's different. So some people need a little bit less, some people need a little bit more. The American College of Sports Medicine also can give us some guidelines. Um, I'm not gonna ask you the specific number. Okay. During exercise, water is always good. We already know that carbohydrates are needed only when we exercise continuously for over an hour. I said this before, but I'm saying it again. 
your carbohydrate solution, like Gatorade, should have about 6 to 8% carbs. And it should be about 70 grams per hour. That's a review. Okay. Uh, we talked about osmolarity already. And we said, what do we say? 200 to 300, I think. The ideal osmolarity of our beverages, our sports drinks, is about 200 to 300 osmolarities. Or 200 to 300 os mini osmoles per liter. That's a review, but make sure you review it. When do we need electrolytes? You need to replenish electrolytes when you've been exercising for about an hour or more in duration. Why? To replace the electrolytes that you sweated out. Huh. It also makes it taste better, which is a good thing. Um, this gives you some more specific information you do not need to know the specifics in terms of these numbers. But what I would like you to know and what these recommendations tell us, much more sodium and much less potassium. So actually, we've got to be careful of ingesting too much potassium because it can lead to arrhythmias with your heart, and we don't want that. So what we're going to find out is the commercial Gatorades will have precisely this balance, which is a good thing. And we tend to lose more sodium and sweat also because sodium is found in the extracellular fluid, which is first to be shifted towards our skin to be evaporated through sweat. Okay, guidelines. Water's number one. Carbs and electrolytes only if needed. Um, try and begin early. What they've shown actually is, well, okay, practice. Don't wait until your game day to figure out what's going to work for you. Actually, a moderate temperature seems to rehydrate us the best. So a, mo a moderate temperature water or Gatorade. If that water or Gatorade is too cold, it can actually inhibit absorption. Uh, I'm not going to ask you the specific temperature, but know that a moderate temperature. So basically room temperature. I like my things to be about room temperature. Um, does that mean that having ice in your cooler is bad? No. But if you have too much ice, it can actually inhibit absorption. We also need to consider hydration after you exercise. Um... I would say, just even thinking about that, putting a water bottle in your hand, okay? Um, you can see some of the recommendations here. Um, you know, if you want to get really scientific, we can break down the amount of ounces you need for every pound that you lose. Um, but don't worry about the specifics. What I would say for post-exercise hydration is have a little fluid immediately after. Okay. And then the goal is that you should be replenishing all the fluid that you lost within about six hours. So you want to start, start slow. You don't want to overload your body immediately after, but just as a ballpark, we should be getting most of that water back within six hours. Of course, you're going to continue after that. If it's eight or 12 hours, you're not gonna die. But that might, that six hours might be a little bit quicker than you once thought. Okay, this is our last, oh, no, okay. We're getting towards the end here. Post-exercise hydration. Um, if you need, well, I mean, water is always a good idea. If you need rapid rehydration, then it should be sports drink. So really, any of these are okay. Immediately after. Immediately after, any of these are okay. Later, you know, three plus hours after you're done. You should be focusing on water. There's just so much information in this chapter. That's why I'm trying to really summarize it. 
Uh, immediately after, pretty much anything is okay. Water, maybe even a little bit of juice, sports drink. Chocolate milk is a great recovery drink because it has carbohydrates, a little bit of fat, a little bit of protein. It's perfect. Um, okay. But hours afterwards, you should be focusing most on water. Home stretch here. Stay with me. Um, these are the guidelines I've also already talked about. Here's a nice summary. The only thing that I, the only specific numbers that I asked you to know were these daily ballpark figures and this one, that during exercise, seven to 10 hours every 10 to 20 minutes. Of course, we're going to replenish electrolytes and carbohydrates if it's greater than 60 minutes or so. Okay. This is the last slide, yes. So how do we assess hydration? I mean, sometimes don't overthink the room. You can look at your urine color. If your urine is really bright pink, or excuse me, I tell you what, this heat's getting to me. If your urine is really yellow, if it's really, really yellow, that means you're dehydrated. Urine should be clear to pale yellow. If you find yourself, if you find yourself not urinating as much, that means that you're probably dehydrated. We can actually use a device to measure osmolarity or what's called specific gravity. You don't have to know that. Um, but you can also use body weight. Like I said, it's very simple. Weigh yourself before, weigh yourself after. See how much weight you lost. If you lost a lot of weight, that very well may be telling you that you are dehydrated. All right. Well done, folks. Study hard. Ask me if you have any questions.